no matter what kind of a quantitative value you have, you may end up with that your data have too many values to represent on your map. However, your visual variables, the number of colors, the number of classes you can show on your map is limited. Human eyes can see about five to seven categories, and that's how much they can differentiate. On the other hand, we may want to utilize that kind of capability to aggregate or to put uh, the uh, numerical values and use those to form classes so that uh, the relevant part of those uh, features will naturally show as similar. And that helps to make a judgment on what features meeting the criteria of your intended use. So uh, we're going to talk about how to create classes in the next few slides. When we put features into a class, uh, we do mean that those features in the class are relatively similar in relation to a certain application or certain question. Uh, so by assigning them into a group and visualize them in the similar symbol, we can easily make it uh, perceivable as uh, similar uh, or closely related features. Remember, we can change the definition of a class, and that definition will depend on the questions we want to answer. This is an opportunity for us to make the features more identifiable by the intended application. Mapping classes require us to first uh, take a step to classify the features into classes. We can choose to do one of the two ways. Uh, the first way is to manually choose some kind of interval so that we can form a number of classes around the range of values on the data. That will be okay if we know uh, what are the criteria we want to define the classes. Okay? In other cases, we may not know exactly what class we want to form, and uh, we're open to different ways of forming classes, or we're exploring ways that uh, make the pattern emerge. So in that case, we may use some standard uh, pre-designed classification schemes to see whether there's any patterns emerge. A class can be defined by specifying the upper and lower limit of the attribute value if we want to uh, make the class meaningful, we can manually specify that so that we will be sure that the range of value is captured in one class. This kind of manually describing or defining classes applies to the case that you really know exactly the criteria you want to apply and you know the specific kind of value range you're looking for. For example, the percentage of forest cover map on the left shows that uh, anything that have less than 50% of the coverage, we know we want to do certain things. Okay? And any area that have uh, higher than 85% of the coverage, we basically classify them as uh, pretty good. So all these are meaningful categories. Well, in this case, because we know what we look for, we can easily define those class limits. The one on the right shows the map of average number of people per household in each of the area. One way to make sense of this, to compare the use national average as a value that others can compare to. We can classify those census tracts as the uh, tract that have the average number of people either below the national average or above national average, and those bring up the meaningful categories. There are two ways to create manually defined class ranges. In ArcGIS, uh, you can find the classification dialog where classification scheme is available from the symbolization tab of the layer property. Uh, if you choose the menu and you give the number of classes you want to create, the ArcGIS will create the number of classes as initial breakpoints 
and then you can move the breakpoints. You can select any of the points and move uh, either left and right to change the, the break value. But if you want to be precise on what exactly the break value you're going to use, you can also type in the break value on the right side of the dialog. So you see there's a sub panel called break values. You can directly type in. One of the suggestions we have is that you should use easy to understand numbers as much as you can. By that, I mean the break value should be simple. For example, if you can break the value at uh, 300, and you will prefer to do that than making the break value to be uh, 299, uh, because 300 is much easier for people to grab on. An alternative way to define classes is to use the percentage as the breakpoints. For example, if you have 100 things form groups, you can uh, define, for example, 5% of the lowest becomes uh, one class, and from 5% to 10% become another class, and from 10% to 40% become the third class. So the breaking points will be defined as percentage. This is shown on the right-hand side of the dialog box. If the numerical data is uh, very new to you and you don't have any predefined criteria for forming classes, one of the common way to decide how to make class is to explore some standard classification schemes and see where the pattern will emerge. The common strategy is to try multiple classification schemes and see which one actually allow the patterns to emerge. There's four commonly used schemes that uh, are implemented in most in geographic information systems and in ArcGIS in particular, natural break, quantile, equal interval, and standard deviation. We're going to talk about each of them in sequence. The way we do this is to specify the classification schemes and, and specify the number of classes will allow the GIS to calculate the class break or the upper or lower limit for each class. Natural break form classes by some kind of natural groupings that the data value showed up uh, in the distribution. Uh, for example, in the histogram charts we see below, the histogram shows there's a diverse range of values. Some of the values tend to group naturally together, and between those groups there's very clear breaks. So these are the indications of natural break. In many cases, if we see that the histogram shows some multiple modality of the distribution, that's the indication that natural break will form a better choice. Um, the problem with natural break is that sometimes it's hard to interpret how this break are formed and what does it mean. Um, but hopefully, if the data really have some kind of basis for that kind of distribution, then it might uh, reveal a certain pattern. The way the natural break as a classification scheme works is that whenever uh, the system is given a set of uh, values, it will first form a histogram and then pick up the class break that uh, will form the best similar values. So they're going to uh, choose a number of seeds value and then try to put uh, groups of other values around those seeds. And they're trying to minimize the within class difference. They're going to maximize the between class differences. It can be done by the system. The problem is that the, the highs and lows are not uh, predetermined. So it's sometimes it's hard to compare across different distribution because uh, they could change. Well, this kind of classification scheme is very good to map data that is highly unevenly distributed. So if you see the values are widespread, and there's equal possibility of being low and high, 
uh, and there's no clear one cluster or one center or one average, then it is a good candidate for applying natural grid. The disadvantage is that it's hard to compare multiple maps that are all made by natural brick because they class them have no connection. You may have to choose different number of classes to see which number of class actually show a better pattern because uh, some of the patterns may be obscured if the number of classes are not chosen to the right number. The second popular classification scheme is called quantile. Quantile classify values by the group so that each group has the same number of things. So for example, if you want to form four groups for 100 things, then each group will have 25 things. For example, the map below shows the population by block group each area representing a block and the color representing the population count. By using quantile, each class uh, occupies approximately the same number of areas and you should not see any dominance of uh, one color or one type of areas. For this particular distribution, we see that the breaking points depend not only by its value, but depend on the ranking order of a particular area among all the areas. The way to classify features by quantile works like this. First, you order the features by the attribute value from low to high and form a rank a list and then you figure out how many features in each class by dividing the total number of features by the number of classes you want to form. For example, if you have 12 features in your data sets and you want to form four classes, and each class should have three features. Sometimes you may not have the whole number, but you can approximate that. And then the rest of the job is just to go through the ranked list and assign each of the features to a certain class. So you start with the first class and pick up the number of features from the first class until the class is filled, and then you start to fill the second class and third class. Let me explain the process through an example. Here we have 12 numbers, uh, giving them uh, in the random order. The first process, like we talk about, is to rank those values by uh, low to high, and then we find out that each class we need to have three features if we want to form four classes. The first class, class one, will have the first three features, 1.5, 1.2, and 1.9. And class number two will have three features, 2.4, 2.4, and 2.5. Class three will have 2.6, and 3.0, and 3.5 etc. If the adjacent value may, may or may not be put in, into similar classes. For example, the feature take 2.5 and 2.6, there's only 0 0.1 difference. Actually, the two features become totally different classes. This method is very good at comparing things that uh, you would like to have roughly similar size. The disadvantage of this method is that features that have close value may end up with different classes. This could be a bad thing if maybe exaggerating some of the difference, which may not be there. So just be careful on the potential negative impact. Equal interval is another way to classify features. We do not look at the distribution. Instead, we just look at the range of the value that the uh, features to distribute over that x, and then divide the value range by the number of classes. Mapping by equal intervals allows us to see how the features are distributed across different uh, sub-area of the value range. The map below shows the population by census block and use the equal interval uh, as a classification scheme. Now we have five classes 
uh, what you can see is that th there's a dominant color of yellow, which means that there are some more features in that category. And those features that tend to be on the extreme of this value range are fewer. And this actually helps to highlight those uh, extreme values. For example, those values are above 80,000, or very few, there's two or three of them. And it's very clear to the audience that they are outliers. In order to calculate the class breaks for the equal interval classes, what you do is to figure out what is the highest value and what is the lowest value to figure out the value range. And then you divide this uh, value range by the number of classes you want to form. And that will be the upper and lower value of each classes. The last uh, classification scheme is called a standard deviation. The idea is that we can form the classes by looking at the mean value of the whole population and then form classes by how far each of the samples, each of the features away from this mean. And the distance is measured by the standard deviation. So you can have a class within one standard deviation of the mean two standard deviation around the mean, or three standard deviation around the mean. And sometimes we can actually form classes using half of the standard deviation instead of the full standard deviation as the breaking points. In the example we show here, the population by census block, and then there are certain blocks that actually deviate from that average by one standard deviation or two standard deviation. So this gives you a very good idea of the central tendency and the spread. Uh, so please review if you forget the idea of uh, means and standard deviation and variance. Uh, we mentioned this uh, concept in lecture three. Calculating class breaks by standard deviation scheme is also not hard. Uh, first, we need to figure out the mean by adding all the values up and then divide by the number of features. The second step is to calculate standard deviation. Uh, the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. We can figure out the uh, class break by just counting where is the one standard deviation away from the central value, the means, and that will be the breaking value, uh, and etc. We can, if you need to define class breaks by one standard deviation as the interval, that's relatively easy. You can also define the class breaks intervals by half of the standard deviation. 